All right, welcome everybody to the Exploring Meteorology talk for the Go Further Conference. My name is Jared Shadler. I am the Outreach Chair for the American Meteorological Society Student Chapter at Iowa State, which is basically a group of undergraduates and professors that work together to create professional development in the field of meteorology. So first off, what do meteorologists do? Just because our name says meteors, we don't actually study them, that's astronomy. We actually study the scientific principles and models to observe and understand weather phenomena and forecast future weather. So first off, let's talk about how we measure weather. So temperature, I'm sure all of you have seen this at some point. A thermometer, it tells you what the temperature is in the current area. For precip, you have rain gauges, which collect the rain that falls. And then you can read off the side to show how much rain has fallen in a certain period of time. Pressure, you have barometers. For wind direction, we have wind vanes, like the ones you see on top of barns. And then for wind speed, you have something we call an anemometer, which measures how fast the wind is blowing from it hitting the little cups on it. So, forecasting. The technical definition is applying science and technology to predict the state of the atmosphere for a future time in a given location, which basically just means we look at all the information like the science, the math, the computer models, and then the current conditions, and we combine that with the experiences that we've seen of previous events to basically take an educated guess on what we think is going to happen in the future in a specific area. Now, if any of you have ever been watching, you know, the local weather, you may have seen all of these different symbols for your fronts and then your pressure systems. So, with the warm front, you have, like, the wet red semicircles. For the cold front, you have the blue triangles. Now, occluded and stationary, you may not have seen very often, but occluded are the ones that are the purple alternating semicircles and um, triangles, which basically means that a cold front and a warm front have met up with each other. And then a stationary front is you have triangles on one side and then your semicircles on the other, which basically means they're running parallel to each other and it's not really moving. And then you also see our low and high pressure systems on the side, which basically indicate areas of, like the name suggests, areas of low atmospheric pressure and high atmospheric pressure, which can drive weather systems. So this is something that we look at a lot in meteorology. These are called station plots. And there's lots of different symbols on them that we use to determine what is currently going on in an area. So the number in the upper left you can see is indicates the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. The number below that is the dew point in degrees Fahrenheit. The shading on the circle represents the percent of sky covered by clouds. So for example, this one is 50%. So the circle is half filled in, so that means if you looked up at the sky, you could see probably about 50% blue sky and 50% clouds. In the upper right, the three-digit number represents the barometric pressure at sea level, which is just atmospheric pressure. And since, and with every station plot, we reduce the pressure down to sea level, because if you only plotted the actual pressure at a station, you would just get a map of elevation, because elevation influences atmospheric pressure. So, with this number also, we take off the initial 9 or 10. So, for example, 147 indicates a sea level pressure of 1,014.7 millibars. So, through practice, you learn when it's a 900 or 1,000. And then, the thing you can see sticking off to the bottom right, we refer to that as a wind barb. So, in meteorology, we don't talk about the direction the wind is blowing. We talk about the direction the wind is coming from. So, for example, we're not saying that the wind is blowing to the southeast in this station plot. We're saying that it's blowing from the southeast. And then those two little prongs you see sticking off of, the one on the end indicates 10, mo 10 knot winds. The smaller one next to it indicates 5. So you add them together to get a range of 13 to 17 knots because in meteorology, we refer to wind in knots, not miles per hour. So this is a map produced by NOAA. It's referred to as a surface analysis, and it has these things that we call contours, which you can see are these red lines that um, snake across the map. So in this one, they indicate, these are known as isobars, which indicate areas of constant pressure, which basically means 
everywhere around that line is the exact same surface pressure. So as you look at them, you can see which way pressure changes as you move across the map, which gives us a really good understanding of what is currently happening in the area. And you can also see on this one that we have labeled the different kinds of fronts, such as the cold front running through the Midwest, or the warm front that turns into a stationary front in the Northeast. And you can also see all the different highs and low pressure systems located across the map. Now this one is also produced by NOAA, and this one's focused more on um, severe weather, which is produced usually by the SPC, the Severe Prote Prediction Center. So you can see that in western Texas, the yellow area refers to areas that there could be severe thunderstorms. And then the red area around it also refers to flash flooding, which you can see is coming off of that low above it, because lows and fronts are usually what initiate most of the severe weather that we see. But even the areas that aren't shaded, they still talk about just precipitation. So like you can see in Florida, it brings up just rain and thunderstorms, and also up in the northeast near Canada, you can also see a giant area where it's referring to just basic rain. So how did I personally know I wanted to be, be a meteorologist? So my story is a little different than most people's. When I was a little kid, I was absolutely terrified of thunderstorms. Whenever I would hear thunder, I would run and hide. I couldn't stand to even hear the word. I wouldn't let my people, my parents say thunderstorms if there was one nearby because I was just so absolutely terrified of them but as I grew older and developed my interest in science I realized maybe if I looked into them I learned about them they wouldn't scare me as much so from middle school elementary school all the way through high school I just slowly became less scared of them and became more and more interested in storms because when you look at them, they don't look super complicated. It just looks like, you know, clouds with rain or just basic clouds. But as I learned, I realized that there's a lot of complex science behind them. And I just became really interested and I wanted to know why when I look outside at the weather, why does it look like that? What is going on? What is different from day to day that makes each individual weather pattern different from the other ones? So... How do you become a meteorologist? Well, first things first, you got to get that high school degree. You got to finish high school if you want to go into pretty much any science. But then afterwards, you need to get a bachelor's degree, which is also your undergraduate, so like your basic, normal college education in either meteorology or atmospheric sciences. The name differs between different universities, but they're fundamentally the same kind of program. So nearby colleges that offer this program, you have... Obviously, Iowa State University, but you also have St. Cloud State University, which is located in Minnesota. You have the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Northern Illinois University, and also Western Illinois University. But you guys are lucky and have a fantastic, one of the best programs in the country, Iowa State, right in your backyard. Which I was lucky because I grew up just 20 minutes away from Ames and I knew that Iowa State was a great program so that's why I ended up coming here. Now, it's not necessary to get your graduate degree but depending on what field you want to go into, which I'll talk about later, it may pretty much be necessary. So after you finish your undergrad, you go and get what's called your master's degree in meteorology which can take two to four years. You can either take it at the school you got your bachelor's, or you can go somewhere else, and it's a lot different of an experience than your undergrad. You're focused more on research than you are on taking classes. You still take classes, but you don't take as many. You take significantly less, and like I said, you're focused more on the research and pushing new science in the field. And then, if you want to go all the way, afterwards you have your doctorate program, which is where you get your PhD and you get that fancy DR in front of your name. Now this can take anywhere from four to eight years. And the difference between getting a master's and a doctorate is that if you want to work in research under someone, you usually go for a master's. But if you want to be that person coming up with the research topics and leading the experience and everything, then you go for your PhD. So what are the different careers in meteorology? Well, you have three different areas, your public, 
and government sector, your academic research sector, and the private sector. So the public government sector, you work for the National Weather Service, which forecasts in offices all across the nation. You can work at NASA and do research, or you could forecast for the military and be a weather officer. So this is just a map of all the different areas that National Weather Service forecast offices exist across the nation. So you can see each state has more than one because one station couldn't possibly forecast for an entire state. Then you get to your research and education sector. So you could teach meteorology, which is whether you could either be doing it in high school or if you get your master's and PhD, you could teach at a university college level or you can perform various research at national labs or institutions to really advance our knowledge of meteorology so we can get better and better at forecasting and other things. Then you have the private sector. So lots of firms want private forecasters f to get, for example, shipping. They want to make sure they get their shipments to places on time without losing product. Or companies like AccuWeather, which pro provide apps and information for people to look at the current weather or even emergency management, to work in cities to make sure that when severe weather events go through, people don't get hurt, and you can make sure that there's the least number of injuries possible from any severe thing by getting the word out to people on what they need to do. Or you also have aviation meteorologists, which work with air traffic controllers to make sure that planes don't fly through storms and have issues, or broadcast meteorologists, like I'm sure you've all seen at some point the person standing in front of the wall, pointing at the map, saying it's going to be rainy here, it's going to get warmer during the day, etc., etc. Now, the best part of meteorology is obviously the severe weather. Your thunderstorms, your tornadoes, your hurricanes. Droughts a little bit, they're not as interesting, but they're kind of a cool concept. And then your flooding and your blizzards. So, what's the difference between a tornado watch and a warning? Watch means conditions are favorable. Warning means one has been spotted. Um, you got your hail, your heavy winds. Flooding means a lot of rain has happened in a small amount of time, which means water levels can rise very rapidly and cause damage. These are two radar loops of the top one is Joplin, Missouri, which was a really bad tornado in 2011, and then your more Oklahoma one on the bottom. These were two of the worst tornadoes we've seen in recent history, and you can really see what we call um, a hook echo which basically indicates rotation, which can create severe storms. Now, tornadoes, the difference between a funnel cloud and a tornado, a tornado is when a funnel cloud has actually made contact with the ground, which is the main difference. You have your EF scale, which goes from 0 to 5, which is measured by damage. So, severe weather safety, where do you take shelter during a tornado? Go to the most interior room possible, get as many walls between you and the outside as possible. So, tornadoes, where do they occur? They occur in an area we refer to as Tornado Alley, which runs through the center of the country, but they also occur in an area called Dixie Alley in the southeast. So, these are the areas that we see the most tornadoes every year. Now, tornadoes can happen in other states, but the ones we see mainly are in this, these two areas. Now, hurricanes. They're defined as a tropical storm with winds 35 miles per hour or greater. The season is from June to November on average, which brings strong winds, storm surges, which is basically water being blown in by the winds and rising really rapidly, or even tornadoes. So how do we name hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean? We alternate between boy and girl names with a six-year rotation of names. Now, I'm sure you've all seen this year that when we run out of names, we go to Greek letters. So speaking of that, this season... This is the only season other than 2005 to have to go to the Greek alphabet. And 2005 was the year of Katrina, which is a very infamous name for a hurricane. Everyone knows it was a really terrible storm. And so far, we've had 25 named storms this season, which is just below, I believe, the 26 that happened in 2005. So we're already at a record-breaking year, but we could almost surpass 2005. So this year has been a pretty crazy year. And the season isn't still, still isn't over yet either. We could still have some more named storms. All right, so time for some trivia. Um, feel free to pause between the questions and give time to talk it over before you make your answer. So first of all, highway and interstate overpasses are safe shelters against a tornado. All right, the answer to that is actually false. 
going underneath an overpass can actually put you in more danger when it comes to tornado because it can cause the winds to get even stronger and send and push you or debris through the underpass. Thunderstorms always move from west to east. Actually, this is false. In North America, they tend to move from west to east. Or, I'm sorry, the northern hemisphere. But, if you go to the southern hemisphere, they actually move from east to west most often. What type of storm most commonly produces a tornado? The answer is C. A supercell, which basically means um, a thunderstorm that's extremely powerful, but also has something called rotation in it. And these are the storms that we most commonly see tornadoes come from. Tornadoes are most likely to occur between the hours of 3 p.m. and blank. The answer is C, 9 p.m. This is because this is the time of day when you get the most heating, which creates the most potential for these severe storms. The only difference between a cyclone, hurricane, and typhoon is the location and ocean it is in. This is true. The only difference between these kinds of storms is where they are located. So you have your hurricanes in the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific, and then you have your cyclones south of India and your typhoons northeast of Australia. What country experiences the most tornadoes? The answer is D, the USA. We have by far a significantly larger number of tornadoes than any other country on the planet due to our unique geographical and meteorological um, conditions that appear on our country. And then our last question, Hurricane Michael was a Cat 4 hurricane that hit the panhandle of Florida two years ago. When was the last time this happened there? D. It has never happened before. We have never had a hurricane of Cat 4 make landfall in the panhandle of Florida until Hurricane Michael. So that's the end of my presentation. So I'd like to thank you for listening to the presentation. And hopefully you are going to walk away from this with some more information on what meteorology is, what you want to do in it, and potentially inspiring you to follow the path of being a meteorologist. Thank you.